So tonight, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, EC2. Uh, you'll see on here I have a focus on monolithic architecture. And I could really focus much on uh, the monolithic part, but it's kind of the um, background that I come from. Uh, most of what we do are web applications um, that are, are more or less small business to medium-sized business. And um, you've seen uh, a few talks in the past here where there's a lot of scripting, um, a lot of scaling out uh, type of things, which is great. However, uh, the majority of our clients uh, only require one or two servers, you know, for the most part. So that's actually what we 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 do, and therefore my focus is is a bit is a little bit different. And um, our shop is is Adobe Cold Fusion, which is a web application servers um, similar to ASP.NET. Um, uh, it's kind of one of the well, it is one of the first um, web application uh, servers. Uh, that was next ASP. Let's see, I I started back in 1997, so that's kind of that's kind of where I come from. Um, like I said, been doing it since '97. Um, Director of Operations for CF Web Tools. Um, we're uh, we're working with Ryan here on on Tech Omaha, um, something that uh, hopefully you guys will start hearing a little bit more about. Um, we, uh, anybody go to the Tech Omaha party back in December? One, one, yeah, two. Um, we'll be having more of those. I am a uh, solutions architect uh, with AWS. And uh, if you guys ever want to check out my blog, it's at christerry.com. A little bit about CF Web Tools real quick. Uh, we've been around for almost 10 years. Um, we have about eight staff here local. Uh, but mostly just all management staff, and then we have um, uh, around, what does that leave us with? About 20, 22 developers, mostly Cold Fusion developers uh, across the United States. Um, oh, we, uh, Col or CF Web Tools is a, um, is a consultant, standard consulting partner uh, with AWS. So the EC2, um, Raise of hands, who has not used EC2? Great, okay. So we'll just, I'll go through all of this. Um, most of it, uh, we'll use a lot of terminology that um, if you're more familiar with it, it'll make a little more sense, but I'll also, I also have some basics in here. So EC2 is um, more or less, if, you, if you're familiar with on-premise servers, that's what it replaces. Um, instead of a piece of hardware where you have to deal with your power and your fire suppression and your backup power and networking, uh, internet access, all that type of stuff, now you can literally write some code and boom, you have the exact same thing, just not in your building. Um, the uh, nice thing is, is it can um, both scale up which is increasing or decreasing your uh, resources, whether it be CPU or, or memory, or you can scale out, which is um, adding more instances, and you can scale down just as easily as well. Um, you don't have to have all that uh, upfront infrastructure costs, you know, your fire suppression, your power, things like that. You can, instead of, you know, if you were to say, hey, I need to, um, uh, you know, we're, we're going to start a company called Object Partners and we need a bunch of servers to host our website and client stuff and development and things like that. Uh, you have to go through all your planning on, um, you know, what kind of servers do we need? What kind of power do you think we need to have? You know, everything from do we need backup power, redundancy and networks, yada, yada. Where that can take, you know, if you're really quick, uh, weeks usually months, if not a year or two, uh, just depending upon what y'all need. But now, you can do it literally in a matter of, say, 10 minutes, you know, which is, which is an extreme 
um, difference from, from your on-premise uh, type of solution. And you can see there that you, know, you can definitely realize a, a definite cost savings as well because you don't have to get all that, all that built out. You don't have to switch out your servers every you know, two years when it becomes outdated and, and so on. So if you're familiar with VMware um, or any other type of uh, virtual server, um, it's a very similar concept. Um, in fact, they use a, a hypervisor, uh, which, which is the controller of like VMware behind the scenes. Um, so because it's a virtual machine, um, it just, it, what it does is it, it basically sections out, fractions out um, resources of a physical machine. Just like a server, if you were to go into AWS, um, at least they used to have things that look just like Blade, or not Blade servers, but um, rack servers uh, like one use. Uh, they don't really keep the public up to date on what they use currently. Um, they're kind of secretive on even where they're at uh, in the United States. Um, I've, I've looked and I think I figured out maybe a couple of places in North Virginia that they have, but other than that, it's pretty darn difficult to figure them out. Um, so to give you an example of what they use, um, just a general purpose server has 96 hyper-threaded cores. Um, it's probably, um, it probably has two CPUs in it. Uh, it has 384 um, gigabytes of, of RAM. They actually use uh, the, the GIB. I, I couldn't tell you what that stands for right at, right at the moment. But instead of 1,024, um, what is it, bits? Uh, bytes, 1,024 bytes in a megabyte, I guess. Uh, it's actually just 1,000. Uh, they, they simplify it. Um, and then it's... Uh, and then the band, they have some pretty massive bandwidth that goes through these things. So basically think of a, a 10 uh, gigabit per second uh, network card that um, sends out your, both your network traffic and your, um, and your storage traffic. Um, I'll get to EBS here in a second, but basically uh, think of it as a NAS. Um, most of your storage is stored more or less in a NAS storage, which is done over network. They also have local hard drives if you want. Uh, the difference is, is that the local hard drives um, are more or less, the data is destroyed if you were to um, stop the instance, uh, whereas um, the EBS uh, is maintained just like a regular hard drive. Um, so they have, uh, so basically, the way that they um, the way that they block these these out is you can get the largest instance, uh, which of course costs the most amount of money uh, per month. And it'll give you that entire 96 cores, 384 gigabytes of memory, and the, the entire uh, bandwidth uh, block. Um, so more or less, you're running out a pretty decent size. Uh, server just running on top of a uh, virtualized instance. Once you start stepping down, it kind of goes, it, it starts spreading out kind of like a tree uh, in increments. So like a step down gives you half of the full machine. Another step down gives you, um, it'd be a quarter. And then the smallest instance gives you um, one, one forty eighths. So basically you can put 48 instances on a single server. One thing to keep in mind, and this kind of comes in handy when you're looking at um, sizing an instance, uh, like if you're going from your on-premise server to uh, AWS uh, virtualized instance, is they go by a unit called virtual CPUs or vCPUs. Uh, two virtual CPUs is the equivalent of one hyper-threaded CPU core. So basically, one vCPU is one, one thread of a dual hyper-threaded core. So
so the way the the way the EC2 um, gets you to where you're going is you can load um, Windows or Linux on any of these servers, and you can either with with Windows you can remote desktop to it, uh, among other ways, um, and then uh, for Linux servers, of course, you can SSH into it, uh, among other ways. Kind of have listed here um, the different. Uh, types of Windows servers that they have. As you can see, they actually go back pretty, uh, pretty far, the uh, 2003. You wouldn't think you would support 2003, but they do. Um, which actually kind of comes in handy because not all companies keep up to date like they really should. Um, you see, I, I really don't see 2000 servers out there anymore, but 2003 you run into every once in a while and you go, hey, my hardware's failing, um, I need to do this or that, and you're like, okay, well, let's, let's get you fixed real quick, and you can just move them up as is on a 2003 instance. Now, one thing that I, ha I haven't noted here in my, um, in my slide deck that I just uh, figured out uh, last week, actually, um, if you were to call um, AWS and say, I have this complex system, and let's say it's 2003, and I need to get to 2008 R2 to be able to support the TLS 1.2, um, what is it, a protocol? Uh, because 2008 R2 is the first um, version to support that. Uh, they actually have a method that they can upgrade in place your, um, your Windows server. Normally, you uh, can't do that. How they can do that, I have no idea, but we did it the other day. Um, Chris, did you that just by yeah, I was actually, um, so right now, uh, authorized.net uh, has um, removed TLS 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, so right now, we're getting a bit of calls on, hey, our stuff doesn't work. Um, so we, uh, we, we called them and figured it out, and <coughs> boom, there it was. <laughs> I don't have too much information on that because I wasn't actually the one who made the call, but I was kind of surprised. Uh, one thing um, that you'll note, like on on-premise servers, let's say you install um, uh, CentOS, uh, you know, basically, Basically, upon boot after install, you more or less log in as root, right? Uh, until you start changing things around, removing root access and adding different users and things like that. Uh, but here you actually don't have that option. Um, when you create an instance, uh, you will actually get a private key that you download from AWS. Uh, and they store your public key on your new instance. And so you actually use a key file to log in. Um, it's a little bit different, a little bit of a hassle, but it, uh, but it also has its advantages. And um, they, they kind of go towards the more secure path uh, AWS does, uh, rather than the easiest path. Um, Windows doesn't use the keys, um, what they, well, they sort of do, but not really. They, when you, um, when you create an instance, uh, it's gonna be administrator with a password that they set, but inside of the console uh, UI, uh, you actually have to enter in your private key and then you can get the password in return, and then they want you to change it. Um, on top of that, which I'll also show you, is what's called uh, AMIs, Amazon Machine, machine Images. What, what were they calling it the other day? AMIs? I think it was called AMIs. People kind of refer it to. I've, um, I've always called them AMIs. Um, and they kind of go beyond um, your standard um, set that you see listed above <laughs> there. I don't deal with other types of OSs, but I think, I'm pretty sure they're out there. Um, they also come with um, prepackaged scenarios like uh, SQL servers installed or MySQL or you know, the LAMP stack, stuff like that. So when you, uh, 
when you create an EC2 instance, you're going to want to know what kind of type do you want. Um, and they give you, see it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, about 11 different types. Um, these are the three that I tend to go towards is the T2, M5, and C5s. Those letters don't stand for much, but uh, so T2s, oh, well, let me start with a letter. T is um, basically a general purpose burstable. Where T comes from, I don't know. The number two um, is the generation. So there used to be a T1 and now there's a T2. Same with the general purpose, the M's. Um, there was a one, two, three, four, five generation for the uh, for the general purposes. Um, so I tend to go towards in the, in, in the web area uh, the T2 instances because uh, they are the cheapest. Um, they have some trade-offs which I will get to later, but they seem to be a pretty good fit for a lot of things I do. The M M5s are. Um, more or less what you would probably get as a general server on premise. Hey, I need a server. Okay, Dell ships you one. Boom, this is what you got, a general purpose server. Uh, you also have uh, the C5s, which are the compute uh, instances where they, um, where they give you a little more processing power. Uh, they put in a little beef beefier CPU for you. Um, and they kind of tune it. Um, it's, you know, you, you don't get as much memory, um, I believe, uh, you know, if you compare it to the M5, because you're more looking for the compute, the CPU portion of it, rather than memory or network or, you know, uh, the, the other things. Um, some of the other ones that I don't uh, really go after, these are more uh, specialized. Um, for example, the X1Es, which are memory optimized, you can see it goes up to 4.2 terabytes, whereas um, I don't have on here what the general purpose does, but 4.2 terabytes for an instance is really large. Um, and those are going to be more for your databases. Um, you also have uh, R4s, which are more or less the same thing, but they're going to be less expensive. You can see it only goes up to uh, half a terabyte instead of four. Um, you have uh, GPU instances uh, for like uh, deep learning, um, speech, speech recognition. Um, these actually give you uh, NVIDIA GPUs uh, on your machine. Um, they, you also have the option on some, if not all, instances to actually add in. Uh, I think they're called elastic, elastic GPUs, um, but those are, those are actually virtual, um, whereas these um, are actually on the motherboard themselves. Uh, so it gives you the, uh, a really good performance. Same with the G3, just gives you some less GPUs. Um, you have uh, F1s, which are the uh, programmable gate arrays. Um, if you're into custom hardware, this is for you. You can basically program your hardware using software. Um, I thought that was for like IoT stuff, but uh, I have in here like video processing, big data, um, analytics. Uh, storage optimized, um, where your, um, your hard drives uh, are actually local. They give you up to 16 terabytes worth of hard drive storage, um, so really fast uh, throughput. Um, uh, the storage optimized, which are the i3s, um, again, sort of like your, um, your H1s, but it's going to be a little less expensive. It has, different, has some different use cases. Looks like NoSQL and uh, some other databases. Um, and then your D2s, um, which are actually, that's actually going to be your most optimized there. You can see 48 terabytes local, local hard drive. And when I say the local hard drive, it's actually on the, on the local machine itself, the local hardware instead of like over the NAS with the EBS. You'll, when you go in um, and you go, okay, I want to I size um, 
my instances, you can um, you can see here like okay, I want a, I want an M5, and you can reference what an what an M5 um, large is, you know, on another chart. But you're probably looking at um, it's probably something like four vCPUs and eight gigabytes of memory, something like that. But you want to go, okay, so what does that actually mean to me? Four vCPUs doesn't tell me anything. What you can do is um, you can look at the ECUs. That's showing up there, right? Yeah. Where the, your M5 large gives you a, um, a number of 10, but your extra large gives you a number of 15. That tells me that the extra large is going to give me a 50% um, power advantage over the large. And you can follow the numbers down there, you know, so 345 on your 24 extra large um, is going to give you an incredible amount of power over your large, you know, going from 10 to 345. So they're going, okay, how does, how does the everyday Joe, more or less, you guys, uh, figure out what, what my processing power is in relation to another one? So the, these are your numbers. These are um, derived from benchmarks that AWS runs. Uh, so they have an algorithm. And these numbers change as they, as they update their hardware, they go back in and they uh, change up these numbers. Um, you'll see on the T2s there, it's variable um, because they're burstable. Um, so uh, basically you have a base computing power, but you can go beyond that base for a certain amount of time. So that it's, hard to, it's hard to really put a number behind that. So with the T2 burstable instances that I was talking about, uh, we tend to use those for uh, web applications. And the reason behind that is, is because, you know, a lot of the day, CPU just really isn't used, but all of a sudden you got somebody that runs a report, or um, you got Google coming in and, um, and uh, hitting every single page uh, for indexing. Um, so what this does is basically, um, depending upon, if you go back to here, you see T2, T2 Nano to, uh, T2 2 extra large. Um, and you'll also see um, the nanos to the smalls have um, one vCPU, you have two vCPUs, four and eight. The larger you go, the more credits you can rack up. Uh, they're, called, they're called CPU uh, credits. And so basically, uh, it depends upon which exact instance you're going, that, you, that you got. But within 20% is more or less your, your base uh, CPU. So anywhere in that 20%, you know, 20% of your CPU, um, it runs pretty much like normal. Um, if you go, and when you're in that 20%, you, get, you gain CPU credits um, per, per uh, it's like per minute or per 15 minutes or something like that. Once you go over that 20%, then you no longer gain them. Well, actually you do gain them, but you also spend them. So once I hit 30 or 50 or 100%, uh, those credits go down relative to the amount of processing power that I need. Um, the advantage to that is cost. The T2 instances are much lower, so they're going after you for, you know, optimizing um, your processes to to be under low CPU usage. But when you need it, it's there. So once you start, you know, hitting your 100% or your 50%, you start using those credits, and then at a certain point in time, you run out of credits, and it drops you back down gradually, and you're kind of capped at the CPU usage that you need or that you can use. And so you want to you want to watch, you want to um, uh, set up some alerts like inside a cloud watch that say, hey, I'm going out, I'm going over my um, my limits or I'm getting close to over my limits. Um, and then you may want to consider 
um, either doing some optimization, maybe you're getting attacked, um, you know, cutting that out somehow, or, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, or you may want to consider uh, scaling up, um, getting additional resources with a, with a better tier, you know, paying a little bit more. Um, there's a chart in here um, where basically uh, this is a very um, this is a very new instance. You can see that it started out at at 600 credits. Um, my CPU usage uh, never really went above six, um, and therefore I've always um, it, it's kind of weird how they do it, but. Uh, basically, you're in the fractions here, and so you're not, you know, you're not using any of your credits. Um, and I'll show you some uh, better uh, examples uh, coming up here. Let's see here. So I have an instance right here um, that I've been running for maybe four hours today. Um, and we can go back to, let's go back to the last three hours. Um, you can, I think this is going to be my spike um, when I first, um, when I first loaded everything up. Uh, so I was using on the average of like 30, 30% uh, CPU. Um, and you can see here that my credit balance has continued to increase. It's gone from 50 to almost 150 uh, CPU credits. And back here, when I was first starting it up, you could see here I was, uh, I was using about five CPU credits on the average. But now that it hasn't been doing anything, um, it's, it's flatlined. If I go back to the past hour here, You can see it's flatline. What I'm going to go do is I'm going to run. It's kind of a small screen, but yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Where did you go to get the screen? The one I'm on right here. This this uh, this desktop. Oh sure. Uh, so this is the AWS console. Um, AWS console. So this when you log into AWS. Uh, you may still be on the old one. Uh, they came out with a new one probably four, four months ago, probably. Um, you may have just not hit the button that says, okay, go ahead and give me the new one. Yeah, so CloudWatch um, is a um, events monitoring service that will give you alerts. Uh, so I can t so let me go back to the screen here. What's that? It is part of the AWS suite. Uh, so if I type in CloudWatch here, I don't have anything set up here, um, but there's uh, you can you can uh, create some dashboards. Um, you can set some alarms. One of the um, default uh, alarms will, is billing alarms, actually. So like if you go over X amount, or you're projected to go over X amount, it can actually send you, you know, an SMS or an email or something like that. So it's saying, watch out. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it's a pretty cool tool. I'm not going to really go over it tonight, but um, uh, it's all rule events, alarm um, centered. So when I go to my uh, EC2 uh, console here, I'll hit the um, running instances. 
and you'll see right here that I have um, the one and only instance running right now um, for my demo. And it's a t2.medium, so it's a burstable medium instance. And I have all my information down here. Um, and I'll go through a little bit more of this here a little bit, but um, once I hit the monitoring tab, this is actually um, behind the scenes uh, part of uh, CloudWatch. You'll see here CloudWatch metrics uh, and CloudWatch alarms, no, no alarms configured. But this just kind of gives you a, a, a quick insight without having to set anything custom up. This is all default graphs. Um, and these are updated uh, every five minutes by default. Uh, you can actually set them to get one minute increments, but it, but it does cost more. Um, so let me go in here and um, let me reconnect here. As you can see, my CPU is uh, pretty well flatlined, um, and I have a uh, CLI uh, up on the screen here that runs a, um, uh, it's a kind of a developer tool for the Adobe Cold Fusion that we run. So I'm just going to do a real start, a real simple um, start command here, which will uh, bring up a web page real quick. And what this does is it's looping through prime numbers. Um, So you can see on the CPU chart, my server's uh, starting up. We're going at about 100%. Now it's open my web browser, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, it's going to uh, loop through prime numbers up to 10 nines. And, be, and behind the scenes, the math is apparently very complex. And that will give me 50% um, of uh, CPU. It's basically running a whole CPU at 100%. Um, so you can see there's kind of flatlining out at 50%. So while that's running, um, we'll hit my next slide. We'll go back to uh, the metrics on this. So just some technicality here. Um, a CPU credit is equal to one virtual CPU running at 100% utilization for one minute. So it's the equivalent of a max out CPU for one minute. Um, if, you know, so, so if you were to reverse that, you get that credit. And now you can spend that credit you know, at 100%. At, uh, at uh, you know, and then let's say you have 30 credits. If you're at 100%, you can do that for 30 minutes until your credits expire. And here's those baselines that I was talking about. Um, so if you get, if you were to get the smallest one, um, oops, if you were to get the smallest uh, burstable instance, your baseline is five percent. You go above five percent, you start spending credits. Um, but if you go to like a small, it's at the 20%, which I was kind of referencing. Um, and then you go to uh, the, like an extra large, you know, it's up to 90. So really, you got to really be pushing it to, um, you know, go over to start spending your, your, CPU, or your uh, CPU credits. There's a option that is fairly new, I think they just released this like in January, where you basically don't have to worry about running out of CPU credits, but you still get the price advantage. Um, the difference is, is that when, when you 
create a standard burstable instance, you get CPU credits right away and then you expend those. And usually you want that because you're um, setting up your operating system, your, your app or whatever you're doing on there and those tend to take, the install processes tend to take a bit of resources. Um, if you go with an unlimited, unlimited burstable instance, you actually start at zero, but the difference is, is that you could still get that burstable um, performance, but they bill you for it. Uh, so you're spending some extra money uh, in order to not uh, get degraded performance if you, run, if you more or less run out of your CPU credits. Uh, so it's, it's take a look at the, the standard you're, you're racking up those, those credits if you go underneath your baseline. You use your credits when you go above the baseline. And then when you, on the standard, you can run out and then it um, degrades your performance. But on the unlimited burstable instances, it just keeps on going and they, and they bill you for it. Let's take a look at how our um, Let's take a look at how our CPU or our uh, process is doing here. That kind of ran out quicker than I thought. The credits eventually get capped, and how do they prevent multiple versatile instances from competing with each other? You know? It's a good question. Not one that I have an answer to. <laughs> So if we refresh this, hopefully we have some decent insight, and we don't. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to this. So I was talking about the hypervisor earlier. The hypervisor is more or less a small, ultra small operating system. Um, most people know it as like VMware, uh, that will run multiple operating systems on top of this, uh, whether it be Windows or Linux. The, right now, uh, most instances run what's called the Zen hypervisor. Zen is, as I understand it, built into Linux, um, so you can basically install Linux, run Zen, and then you can run your VMs on top of on top of Zen. They have a customized version of Zen, and um, it's, it's actually spelled X E N, um, and uh, that's the way they've been doing it for quite some time, with some exceptions now. Uh, the M5, which is your general purpose, and your C5 instances, uh, which are your compute, uh, now run a um, hypervisor called Nitro. Um, I'm sorry, Zen, Zen was actually not part of Linux. Uh, KVM is part of Linux. Uh, and Nitro is a customized version of KVM. It's actually uh, very simplified um, because they didn't need everything inside of KVM, so they just decided to delete a bunch of code, more or less. Um, so one reason they brought, the primary reason they brought in Nitro or KVM um, on the M5, C5, and I3 instances, they have a chip called um, ASIC, A-S-I-C, uh, which offloads all of your virtualization needs uh, off to this chip and set of surrounding hardware. So now instead of when you run a virtual machine, it tries to go, you know, the, um, if you were to do this on premise more or less, it goes back to your CPU. It does some things that the CPU says, oh, that's virtualization. We're going to handle this a different way. Um, instead of doing that, now your VMs actually just talk directly to this ASICs um, and leaves your CPUs for the consumer to run your Windows and your Linux on. So you're not competing with your hypervisor and your networking and your storage needs um, on your CPU, 
you can that's that's all left to just whatever you want it to be uh, and all that is offloaded off to this ASICs uh, which the nitro hypervisor uh, takes care of um, so it's a separate chip separate it's like a PCI card more or less uh, and um, so all your networking traffic all your storage traffic uh, as long as you're using EBS which is at NAS um, and the administrative uh, tasks for hypervisor, you know, your permissions, your firewall, etc., is handled by this ASICS chip. To give you some graphical examples here, um, back in 2013, before they had Nitro, uh, you would have your um, your your Zen uh, hypervisor. And it, it looks a little complicated here, but basically you're looking at instant storage, um, which is your local hard drives, uh, the uh, ones that go away after you stop the instance, uh, your EBS volumes, which is your, um, uh, your NAS, and your networking. Uh, that would all uh, go, go back to um, your uh, main CPU, uh, your main motherboard um, hardware. And, uh, and then head out from there. Uh, they brought in uh, C3 in November 2013, and they offloaded uh, the networking. It's called enhanced networking uh, because they offloaded it. It's, um, they actually changed up the drivers. Um, so, no, I'm sorry, I haven't got to that point yet. As uh, they change the drivers for elastic, uh, elastic networking, but um, basically uh, because they offloaded it, it started to become faster. Thus, called enhanced networking. So they offloaded the networking portion of it um, to uh, to this ASICS uh, chip, and this was actually an off the car, off the shelf card. Uh, that they actually just bought from uh, this vendor and they plugged into their PCI uh, slot and boom, uh, they were in business. Uh, January 215th, they have the C4. As you can kind of see here, they have um, third generation and then fourth generation. Now they've offloaded uh, not only the networking, but they've uh, offloaded um, your storage. Uh, so networking storage and so what you have left is your um, administration portion of it then you have uh, then they did the X1 in May 2016 so a couple years back uh, this is where they introduced the elastic networking adapter uh, before uh, before the ENA uh, they uh, mimicked standard network cards uh, and they weren't um, scalable, let's say. Um, with the Elastic Network Adapter, they wrote their own, and it is um, very flexible, thus the, thus the elastic part of it. And you don't, it, it's, the concept is you don't have to constantly upgrade your network adapter driver as things get better. Um, so this is where they uh, move from an off-shelf uh, network adapter, um, and then they went to uh, what they considered the first Nitro card. Um, I know there's a little bit more behind uh, what that all involves, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Then you have the i3. Um, back in February 2017, which, um, so the i3 is when they, when they introduced, uh, sorry, I'm reading my notes here. So this is where they have onboard SSD uh, storage. Um, where they can support 
they have they have eight on board what they're called N NVMe drives, which can support three million IOPS, which is pretty extreme. Um, so this is you know basically your storage uh, optimized, and they're they're using the Nitro card uh, to be able to accomplish this. So basically, your your hypervisor uh, still uh, your Zen uh, hypervisor at this point. Uh, talks directly to the Nitro card, which the Nitro card then talks to these um, onboard uh, NVM. Oh yeah, so the NVM is uh, is those uh, the, it kind of like memory. They look like memory instead of a hard drive. Uh, kind of had to remember that in here. The C5 is back in November 2017. Um, So this is this is where they mo uh, started moving from the Zen hypervisor to the uh, Nitro hypervisor. Um, the primary reason for this is because the the Zen and the, even the KVM that they were using uh, that the that the Nitro is based upon was just too complicated. It was too much overhead, and so they more or less started deleting code out of the hypervisor to to make it faster and simpler to uh, to maintain. Uh, and this is also where they uh, eliminated the uh, management, the administrative portion of, of things. So now everything, um, now all, all underlying resources um, are, you know, the CPU, the memory are available to the VMs directly. There's no sharing whatsoever, like the previous ones where they started offloading, but still some of it was shared. Um, now this is completely offloaded. Then comes uh, I3. Uh, dot metal instances um, because everything is offloaded onto these um, nitro cards. Uh, you more or less are remote controlling this motherboard with your um, with your nitro card, and thus now you can put in all reality any hypervisor that you want um, on top of these machines um, because more or less you have. A robot controlling your 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 motherboard, uh, so they so they um, partnered up with VMware, and now you can run the uh, AWS uh, hypervisor, which is your Nitro, or you can run VMware. So you can, if you have an on-premise VMware, you don't want to go through all that hassle of converting everything over to AWS uh, hypervisor. You can just do a direct migration, more or less, um, or even hybrid some of it. You know, on your VMware, at um, your on-premise, or in some of it on uh, AWS, and you can scale out that way if you wanted to. Uh, a good example would be Christmas. You got a store. You know, most of the year you can run it on your on-premise stuff because you, you haven't migrated for one reason or the other. You never plan to, um, but you don't want to have all these extra resources for Christmas for three months, so you can just scale out to. AWS, have it for three months, delete it afterwards. <coughs> EBS, uh, elastic block storage. Um, so you can kind of see a theme here with the, with the elastic stuff. Um, think of uh, like a rubber band. You can scale it out. You can scale it in. Well, I guess it's more or less scale up, uh, scale down. Um, but they have three different uh, types of um, EBS volumes, and, the, and EBS is your is you know your NAS. Um, so you have uh, your per, um, your IO ones, your provision IOPS SSD, uh, and you can kind of see a matrix here. This is going to be your highest cost solution, but it also gives your highest IOPS and your highest throughput. Well, it, high throughput actually. Um, GP2, your general purpose SSDs. If you were to start up a EC2 instance with all the defaults, this is what you're going to get, is your GP2, uh, GP2s. It's basically just a standard SSD drive that you can more or less get from Best Buy, plug it in, boom, uh, you got your GP2s. Um, has some high IOPS, and uh, throughput is actually a little bit low, and it's a medium cost. Uh, the ST1s um, are actually your um, magnetic uh, hard drives, um, and you can see here low IOPS but high th highest throughput, 
And basically what they're going after here is sequ sequential data. So if you have streaming data and you're storing it sequentially, that's what magnetic drives are for. It's, you know, you kind of think back to magnetic tapes back in the day. It's just all in your data. So when your hard drive is spinning, your, your, your needle isn't having to go back and forth, you know, getting all your delay in there, but it's just, you know, it'll slowly go down. So that's, that's where that um, comes into play. Uh, and then you have your SC1s, um, your cold, what they're called the cold drives. Um, it's your lowest cost and, um, you know, maybe a good example might be um, YouTube archives. You know, everybody uploads to YouTube, it's great for a week or two, and then nobody ever sees it ever again, but it's never deleted. Um, but if somebody wants to see it, they want to see it pretty much right away. So let's say YouTube says, okay, it's been a month, we've had like nobody look at this darn cat video for two weeks now. Um, let's go ahead and put it on, uh, let, let's give us a little bit more um, cost effective storage. So they'll put it on there. Um, so it's basically infrequently accessed. If you need it, it's there, but you know, you're not, you're not gonna host a database on it. Uh, you cannot, the, the cold hard drives um, cannot be your OS drive. It has to be a secondary drive, your data drive. This brings us to backups. There are many, many, many ways of doing a backup. So you can find um, your AMIs uh, that have um, all your leaders of backup storage and anywhere in between. Um, one way to uh, simplify the process, and this is uh, actually the way that we do it, is uh, AWS has a, uh, I can't remember what they call it, but basically uh, you, you push a button and you implement this, um, you implement this process, and, uh, and all of a sudden you got backups. And what it does is it schedules EBS snapshots. You know, once a day, twice a day, hourly, however you want to do it. Um, it's the most simplistic free way of, of doing it. Um, it doesn't, I don't believe it will shut down an instance which they say is the best way to go, especially if you have sensitive data um, because um, you still have stuff in memory. So like if you got a credit card in memory and somebody gets a hold of your snapshot, they could potentially get that, um, that credit card data out of memory. Um, but we really don't deal with that type of sensitivity for the most part, uh, so this is a good way to go. Um, so uh, when you take a look at your snapshots, I think I have that on the next screen. Um, yep, you'll see you'll see underneath the name here. Um, you can match that up with the volume uh, your um, uh, your EBS volume. You can see here uh, that basically I'm doing two drives, uh, March 4th, March 3rd, March 2nd, 20 and 60 gigabytes. Uh, you can kind of see that these volumes uh, more or less match up here and here. And then these are just um, unique IDs for your snapshots. So now you go, oh, okay, um, XYZ hacker came in and now my data is destroyed. Um, I can shut down my instance, replace my drives with these snapshots and be back up within 10 minutes um, to the last uh, snapshot. So if I were to lose all my data, I'd be looking at uh, yesterday at uh, 6.02 p.m. Uh, I think that's gonna be UTC, UTC time. Elastic Network Adapter, um, that was uh, something I mentioned uh, before. Um, pretty recent, you can see here, uh, it was released in the mid-2016, uh, up to 25 gigabits per second. Um, you know, much, much of the time, you don't need that kind of bandwidth, but it's there if you need it. Uh, big data, streaming, streaming data, uh, that type of thing, you might use that. Um, 
It's a heck of a lot uh, better than my on-premise, you know, 100 megabit or one or one gigabit per second uh, network that uh, probably will never live up to its one gigabit reputation. Um, you know, I was saying that uh, as their equipment becomes better, let's say they replace uh, their 25 gigabit switch or whatever they're using with a 100 gigabit per second switch, um, you don't need to uh, grow or you don't need to upgrade your uh, device drivers. Um, they've built in that elasticity into, uh, into those drivers. The Nitro hypervisor uh, that we were talking about, not the Zen, but the newer one, the Nitro hypervisor, um, you can put a maximum of 27 um, volumes of, you know, your EBS storage volumes uh, and or uh, network interfaces uh, on this. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard limitation. Uh, so the example I have here is you can put you can have like three different network interfaces going um, for whatever reason, um, and then you can put 24 uh, EBS volumes, you know, uh, C through the Z drives basically uh, for Windows. Um, something to keep in mind that there is a hard limit there. Something I mentioned before too, as well, uh, when you um, when you create an EC2 instance and you want uh, GPUs associated with it for one reason or the other, uh, you can attach uh, virtual uh, GPUs. You can see here it shares the network bandwidth like EBS volumes. So they have somehow they've been able to basically have a bunch of GPUs just somewhere and then your network traffic will um, take advantage of those. Not as performant as the ones that are actually on, on board, but they work. Uh, billing, uh, probably about a year ago, they went uh, from hourly. Uh, so if you started up an instance, you got billed for an hour uh, to down to the second. Uh, the catch is, is that uh, Windows is still an hour. Linux uh, is actually per second. So Linux, you can have it up for a minute and you get billed for 60 seconds worth of usage. Um, there's use cases out there that I really uh, uh, don't use for my part, um, but there's use cases out there that uh, where apparently this saves people quite a bit of money. Security groups, uh, this acts as a firewall. Uh, there's a hard uh, 100 rule limit per group. Now. When I tell you that there's limits, that's usually a soft limit. You can usually go to AWS and go, hey, I need more, and they usually give it to you. You just kind of have to give them a well, why, um, and you'll see more limits coming down here. If, um, let's see here, I'll give you an example of uh, a security group. So this is, uh, this is my EC2, uh, dash or console and um, you can see here that uh, it's this is the monitoring uh, that we were looking at before my, unfortunately my demos uh, just not taking long enough to uh, show me on my cloud metrics here for the uh, CPU use uh, credits but hopefully you get the idea security groups um, so when I uh, on, on my VPCs, VPC is a virtual private cloud, by the way. That's basically um, uh, a virtual switch, virtual router, uh, virtual internet gateway, virtual whatever you might have in your on-premise um, that gets you out to your network one way or the other, including the internet. Um, <clears throat> you always get a default one. You just kind of, I just uh, leave alone. I don't think you can actually even delete it. Yeah, you can't delete the default. Um, I just don't use it. Uh, and I leave a, uh, I leave one in here which basically um, gives me access to my 
uh, my, my office um, to allow me to come in and uh, RDP or SSH, depending upon the circumstances, uh, into, the, into the machines. But for our purposes here, if you take a look at the OBI demo, uh, which, I, which I'm using today, I have a very simple rule. If you look down here, uh, the inbound rules, um, you see all traffic, all protocols, all ports for OBIs, which is object partners, uh, IP address. Um, and then I'll just delete that when I'm done with the demo. Um, and then this network won't have access to, uh, to my instances anymore. Um, so when you do this, you have to keep in mind that you know, any one of you could be on your laptop right now, hit up the address, but then you still got to get past my username and password, but it does allow you that additional um, point of access. Um, keep in mind that you're tra depending upon what you do, the traffic may or may not be encrypted. If you're doing a simple FTP, it's pretty much wide open, especially if you're on if you're on Wi-Fi. You can hit edit here. You can add different rules. Um, for example, like uh, just ign let's say that the first rule doesn't even exist. I can add uh, one for like SSH. It knows that SSH is a TCP I22 uh, port, and uh, I can put in um, let's say I at a remote location or have another client that needs access. I put in an IP address or a class of uh, IP addresses. Um, one thing they were lacking for a long time was this description here. So you would put these in, you go, well, shoot, what the heck was 69.96.28? I completely forget. So then you might go in and delete it. Hopefully you had it documented. But you probably didn't, so you go in and delete it, and all of a sudden somebody doesn't have access. So this was a really nice feature uh, that they added probably just about a year ago. So what that allows me is, uh, like I said here, is, uh, it, it is my computer right now, right here, to remote desktop in to this guy right here. You'll see here. Um, you can also restrict your outbound traffic. Um, but you, when you set a, an inbound rule, um, it is, um, I'm trying to remember the, the term for it, but basically that when, when you have uh, inbound traffic, that same outbound, tra outbound traffic is, is also allowed. Stateless. Stateless. I think this was actually this would actually be stateful, right? Yeah. Uh, your um, you also have uh, VPC rules, which is uh, this this would be the equivalent of, of your firewall, uh, but you also have VPC rules, which would uh, basically be the equivalent of like your router, um, which which are actually stateless. Uh, well, I'm sorry, what? Uh, yeah, um, that is a different service. I'm just going to generically answer that yes right now. All right, so. If you ever go, okay, one-on-one on AWS, how do I create EC2, they're going to show you how to do it in the console. Show you how to do that real quick. So when we go to, uh, when we log into the AWS console, um, you may or may not see EC2 here, but you can type in EC2, hit go there. You also, I also have them uh, pinned up here for easy access. Um, on a new account, you'll see zero running instances, zero volumes, zero key pairs. Um, I'm in the Ohio, Ohio region, but you can, um, the default is North Virginia. You can do California, Oregon, or you can even do across the seas if you wanted to for some reason. Um, but um, 
So one thing that you can do here is hit launch instance. This will bring you to your AMIs um, or your AMIs. And from here, you get your choice of what OS to use. Actually, before I do this, um, I see we're kind of at the hour mark. Let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. So, if, uh, the, so the most basic part of uh, booting up a EC2 here is just going, going to um, uh, the AMI uh, section of it. And you can see uh, Linux. Um, Amazon Linux is based upon CentOS. Uh, they kind of have their own um, optimizations behind it. Uh, it's a pretty nice system. And uh, you got stuff like Red Hat, uh, Red Hat Ubuntu, um, Microsoft's uh, um, Windows Server. Uh, you have Windows Server with um, SQL Server, and so on. So what we'll do here real quick is we'll just launch a um, Amazon Linux instance. Uh, we'll just uh, select the uh, T2 Micro and just kind of use uh, some of its defaults. Here you can see uh, the, the T2 Unlimited option that you can put into play. Here's where you can define your EBS. Um, the default's eight, but you know you could do you know 60 or, or however much you want. Um, you can also add a new volume, which would be you know like your data drive. Uh, you can make that however much you want. Um, you can see here that um, this is where you um, select your different types of uh, hard drives that it uses. Um, you, also, you also have the option of encrypting uh, your hard drive. When you drop on a drive, is that in a fault tolerant drive or is this a physical drive? It's, a, it's in a RAID array, yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty darn resilient. They, there's a number of nines behind it. I couldn't tell you right offhand. Um, you can tag it. Um, for example, like if, um, if, if I'm doing a bunch, of, well, let's give an example of like um, departments, and you could do like um, billing. And uh, that way when you run reports at the end of the month and you go, hey, where did I spend my money? I can say, okay, billing had X amount or R&D had this amount, you know, things like that. You can configure the security group, uh, like I showed you before. And if you notice here, we can do multiple ones. They build on top of each other. Hit review and launch. And this just kind of gives you a summary. Hit launch. Here's where that key pair comes into play. Um, I already have an existing key pair, but I could create a new one. Um, in fact, I'll do that here real quick. Uh, we'll just call it some. Um, uh, AWS Omaha <laughs> test. We hit download key pair. You can see down here uh, that it tried to um, download, well, it did download uh, the PEM file, which is your private. Uh, and then you go ahead and launch your instance. Um, so when I um, view instances, you'll see here that it is uh, creating my uh, new instance, which will be more or less a CentOS uh, operating system on a, uh, on a, on a virtual instance. Uh, it should be pretty quick. So it's running. I hit, um, I hit this, and here is my default uh, public IP or public DNS name with my default uh, public IP address. Um, if I were to be uh, on the inside, let's say from a, another server, uh, here's my private IP address and private uh, DNS address. We can go ahead and delete it as quickly as we created it.
Another way um, we can uh, do this is through cloud formation. Cloud formation is another service on AWS. And this is where you start getting into um, infrastructure as code. Uh, Brian's given um, some other uh, talks on using third-party uh, utilities uh, to also do this. It's a preference slash uh, needs-based uh, scenario. Uh, sometimes third-party solutions what you need. Sometimes cloud formation is all you need, or you know maybe even just the console like we did before is all you need. It just really depends upon what you're doing. So as a real quick example here, we're just going to go ahead and create what they call a new stack. Um, they have a template designer, but really all this is behind the scenes is just a JSON file. You'll see down here um, the uh, new template, just JSON down there. Um, we can do a, an example template. We'll go ahead and do a WordPress example. Um, this is the instance. This is a security group that it's going to create. And down here is the code that it takes to create what you see represented graphically here. Um, you got the uh, description. Um, it's going to create a database, a, um, a WordPress database, uh, create the database user. Um, it's going to tell us what kind of instance type, the security group rules here, uh, port 80, port 22, and, and so on. So what we can do is hit Uh, YAML, uh, yep. So you can do JSON or YAML. Exactly the same thing going on here. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and uh, create the stack, which is basically just creating our web server instance in the security group with the push of this button. Um, and it's stored inside of this. Uh, URL, which is on S3, which is a um, object-based storage uh, service. I'm not going to get into it today, uh, but it's basically just going to be a JSON or a YAML file uh, that's stored up there. Hit next, um, and then it's going to ask me for some different things. Uh, so I'm going to give it the name of test. Um, What instance type I want to do it on, uh, key name, which is my private key, um, and uh, this is going to be your security group rule. And you can tag it like we did before. Um, your permissions, rollback triggers, and, and so on, uh, things that you can uh, take a look at uh, later. This just gives me an um, overview of what's going to be created. Uh, and then, now, I'm not going to do this, but basically if I were to leave out um, like my key pair, uh, it would go through the script and, and up until it sees that, uh, sees that I have no key pair, so I can't create my instance, and then roll everything back uh, that it had. So I hit Create. Refresh, and now you can see here it's creating uh, the stack. This is a very simple stack. Right now we're doing web server and uh, security security group. We can do, but we, it can do web server RDS, which is um, your C, uh, SQL server, um, maybe some Lambda.